I would now like to um, read the beginning part of um, Harry's story. And uh, if I get it wrong, Harry, you correct me now. <laughs> As Flight Sergeant Harry Dennison settled into the mid-upper turret of Halifax Bomber NP-799, he was told that the plane that had taken off ahead of him had crashed, having told about a kilometer. The crash may have been caused by ice forming on its wings. This was March the 5th, 1945. And the airbase at Linton on Ouse in Yorkshire, England, was cold and misty. Dennison and his crew were tired. They had been on a long flight to Germany the night before. Despite the weather, Dennison's pilot, Flight Lieutenant Jack Kirkpatrick, rolled NP-799 down the Tarmac runway after the crew had checked their equipment. Dennison, a farm boy who grew up near Vernon in the interior of British Columbia, checked, as he always did, to make sure his parachute was clipped to the plane's fuselage near his turret. That night, they were flying to Chemnitz, a city in eastern Germany. At a pre-flight briefing, the crew was told that Chemnitz was the site of factories making items such as ball bearings, for the German military. As NP-799 left England, the weather improved. Dennison was looking out of the dome above his turret in the middle of the plane. He was watching for German night fighters that could approach swiftly and fire on the heavy, slow-moving bomber. To avoid detection, NP-799 and the other bombers maintained radio silence. They also kept their lights off. Kirkpatrick was flying MP-799 on a steady course at about 14,000 feet. When the bomber was about an hour away from Camden's, the pilot started to climb to 22,000 feet. He wanted to prevent the bomber from becoming easy prey for the anti-aircraft guns protecting the city. Edison kept watching. Neither he nor anyone else in the crew saw anything unusual. It had been an uneventful flight. But suddenly, Dennison heard an explosion. Something had hit the plane. The dome of the gun turret shattered. A piece of the heavy plastic in the dome fell on Dennison's head, cutting him from the right ear to the chin. Bleeding profusely, Dennison slipped out of his turret seat and dropped to the floor. He wanted to get to his parachute and attach it to his harness. Unable to see in the dark, Dennison did not know what had caused the explosion. He did not know if a night fighter had fired on the bomber or if another bomber had accidentally collided with MP-799. He also did not know that MP-799 was completely breaking up. He was rapidly descending in just the center section of the bomber's fuselage, half the body of the plane. Dennison was completely immobile. As the bomber hurled, hurtled toward Earth, the inertial forces pinned him to the fuselage floor so that he could not reach his parachute. He thought of his crew, Kirkpatrick, the pilot. Giles, the flight engineer, Flying Officer Bob Fresnel, the navigator, Flying Officer Bud Stillinger, the bombing, Pilot Officer Jack Lawson, the wireless operator, and Pilot Officer Roald Gunderson, the tail gun. Were they still alive? Dennison couldn't see or hear any of them. Then he thought about his family. His father Norman and mother Ethel back on their farm in British Columbia. How would they feel when they learned that their son had been killed? A German citizen 
Rene Cigar, who researches Allied planes that were shot down near Kamnitz, mm -hmm. saw Harry's story on the internet because a condensed version of Harry's story from my book is on my website. I found this, interest, this information to be interesting, but what really intrigued me was when Rene offered to send to Harry and me some pieces of the wreckage and some photos of the wreckage site. I would now like to present these photos and pieces of the wreckage to you, Harry. They are from Rene and his friend Tobias Graham in Germany. 